shadow on the wall that looks like a man. No, that lamb just moved on that stand. I got movement in the cellars, I got footsteps in the hall. There's no time to waste, I better make some calls. I gotta get ready, make everything right. Cause all my routed friends are goes hunting tonight. Friends or goes hunting tonight. is a long history, it should be real, real good for activity, and we got the house, wired for sound, and got motion along, setting all around, got a box full of batteries ready to go, and everyone's itching to stop this show, got our logo tees, driving black SUVs, and that one bald guy with a slick goatee, <laughs> Friends of goes hunting tonight. Hey, round up the team. Let's get started. Hey, this is your big brother, Mike Cohen. Well, there's our party and y'all invited. We got the camera set. Let's turn off these lights. Cause all my rider friends of goes hunting tonight. That's right. Go get them, boys! And welcome, everybody, to FEMA TV. Welcome to October 18th, 2013. This one's almost over already. It's getting there. Picks up speed, I think. Well, it is on the downhill. It, yeah, it's on the downside of the month. Kind of like where all the uh, downhill electricity pools together. Right? Yeah. It's like, it's you burn less gas going south than you mm -hmm. do going north. Yeah, and you always get home faster because it's downhill. Right. No matter where you've been. Makes sense to us. Um, real quick, let's get some business knocked out of the way. Um, today is... Friday? Today, the 18th? Did you it already? Yes, okay. I did. Um, first of all, y'all be sure and check out Metaluna Boutique and Stones um, online. Um, MetalunaBoutiqueAndStones.com That's one of our old school toys. Yeah, old a little school. little it's Eeyore. Eeyore. It's Eeyore, man. Everybody loves Eeyore. He's adorable. Um, also, uh, be sure and check. Uh, there's going to be some handmade jewelry going to start showing up over there. Um, there already is handmade jewelry, just different handmade jewelry. Yeah, well, actually made by my own little furry hands. Yeti handmade jewelry. Yeti handmade. Pure quartz. Mind everything. Um, but it'll be up on the website soon enough. Um, also coming up November 9th, we have this little gathering that we're throwing together. This kind of a shindig kind of thing. Oh yeah. yeah. Marshall's on and holidays. Marshall, Texas. November 9th. 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then... Oh. Snarf down as much as you can from 9 to 11 is the investigation. We have two separate locations for the investigations. We have some beautiful speakers. We have Reverend Rita Louise, or Dr. Rita Louise. Mm -hmm. Reverend Robin Marie. Yeah, it's Reverend Robin Marie. Mm -hmm. The one and only Mary Gasparro. Mm -hmm. Jason McLeod. Lyle Blackburn. Geraldine Sutton Stiff. Larry Flackman. And Mitchell Whittington. And then we've got a few other little things. And today we got all our games in. Mm -hmm. in and yesterday we got all our prizes in for the Cohen Carnival. Yep. 
So be sure and come in there. And if you buy your tickets online, bring two canned goods in. We'll give you a buck back. And then you can go spend it at the Cohen Carnival. Exactly. So the Cohen Carnival is actually to help pay some of the medical bills. A friend of ours and what part of the art team, Shonda, just had a little baby, 23 months, mm. 23 weeks into her pregnancy. He's up to two pounds, he's, but he's already had surgery twice. and he's come fine. Yeah, and at the very best. He's still not supposed to get out of the hospital until after Thanksgiving. Yeah. So, he's so the, the bills are racking up really quick and really hard. So we're throwing a Colin Carnival to raise some yep. money to help them. Most definitely. And his name's Colin. That's why it's the Colin, Colin Carnival. Tom. Yeah. Um, also, November 1st, 2nd, 1st and 2nd, and I'm not sure about the 3rd anymore because of a change of venue, um, but you can come meet me. And a whole lot of other people down in San Antonio um, for the Dia, Dia de los Muertos Paranormal Conference. Eventually, this Texan will learn some Spanish. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, Scott Grunewald is going to be there. Uh, Bradbury Kling will be there. Um, Jim de Villiers will be there. Uh, the Contreras brothers will be there. Uh, Jason McLeod will also be there, too. Um, so come Ken join Gerhardt. us. Ken, yeah, Ken oh, Gerhardt. Pat, Pat, um, oh, and also just announced. Patrick Burns. And also just announced yesterday, Debbie and Mark Constantino will be there. So that's going to be pretty cool. So be sure and join us there. But enough yakking about what we're going to do. We, we have a special show tonight that's all about what Mary and Mark are doing. The M&M's. The M&M's. <laughs> I have to know what color, Mark. Yellow? I'm thinking yellow. Blue. Okay, okay. Mary, Sorry. Mary, which color would you be? Green. The green one? Yeah, okay. I kind of I kind of figured as much. Just so everybody knows, our guests tonight are Mary Gasparro and Mark Cerro. Um, Gasparro and Cerro, the M&M's. Um, <laughs> and you forgive me, guys, but what's the name of your co-op? It's paracoop.org. Para, para co-op. Okay. But uh, you guys the, are... We have a local group, uh, Middletown Para Co-op. event up there Mary well when you think of Halloween you naturally think of the Shanley Hotel <laughs> it's just one of those places but we we actually uh, the para co-op had their very first investigation at Fort Mifflin the month before so we kind of kicked off and Sal and Jen who are members of the co-op they were there so it was great you know being able to investigate with some of our people and they will be joining us at the Shanley also. Yay! Sal and Jen are always really good investigators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think Mark's really happy. Well, I'm I'm happy all the time when I'm with them because they're like my adopted family. But Mark's really happy because Sal's really techie. Yeah. And you know you know how Mark is when it comes to the tech stuff. Well, it, it's easy when you have a person. To, when you're able to say, I need a camera here, and they know exactly where you're talking about and exactly where to place it, instead of sitting there on the walkie-talkie for 45 minutes, left, left, no, a little bit right, no, wrong hallway, turn around. Or sitting down looking at a suitcase full of stuff like a monkey that just found, you know, bananas in a suitcase, because you don't know which one. Bananas? No, Mark, <laughs> calm yourself. Yeah, you, know, you just got them all distracted, Mark. Focus. <laughs> no, that's the way Mark gets when when you open up a case and there's all kind of connectors and ooh. Well, you know, it's all things that make me excited. And you uh, guys, and you guys are also just so just so our viewers know they can go to. The
tonight, of course, is going to sell because people who work are off on the weekend. But you got the good old diehards that are venturing up for both nights. Um, so, like I said, we, we're still pushing a few tickets left for Friday night. But it's it's going to be good. And uh, thanks to Mark here, he has been working nonstop in perfecting his production oh. equipment. Well, yeah, it's a, you know, yes, it's been a work in progress as always. But you know, every time that Mary and I have, we've been doing these events now over the last so many months, it's I always walk away with it. Obviously, having a good experience, but what are the lessons learned? And for me, it's what what can I do to improve the production value of the broadcast, and where are the holes and gaps? You know, one of the biggest challenges we've been trying to overcome over the last few events was audio. You know, we had wireless audio at the Shanley back in August, but yet we didn't have audio on all the cameras. And then the audio at Port Mifflin was just non-existent except for on the mosquito cam, where you heard the mosquito in 5.1 surround sound buzzing the camera for hours on end. Um, so that was one of the biggest things, like, that coming into next weekend that I've been talking with Mary to try to improve. So we, we're going to have wired audio at every camera. You know that's going to be in the in the Shanley. We're going to have a close follow cam that's going to be following the, the team throughout the course of the night. We're also going to be able to broadcast the the, the paranormal puck. We're actually going to get to see the screen and hear what it's saying and interact with it live on through the chat room, um, as well as the uh, aerial drone, which will be making its debut on the ITC lounge. Uh, of course, that won't be live, but it'll be. Some, some, we'll be collecting, gathering footage for broadcasts later on, um, and all the other things that we that I've been trying to work on, make improvements to. And as my wife smirks at me for <clears throat> knowing all the money that has been spent over the last so many weeks since the last investigation event, because. I get OCD like when it comes to equipment, and once I start obsessing over something, I have to buy it. <clears throat> you know, I can't get away with it. So I'm in therapy. I'm good. The aerial <laughs> drone, you finally got that helium shark and hooked the camera to it, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. With freaking laser beams. <laughs> oh, uh, that would be a Death Star, wouldn't it? No, it'd be the, a Alan, Death shark. the Alan Parsons project. <laughs> well, it'd give something to chase the pig Pink Floyd put out there. Um, what's what's something people can expect um, at this event? Is there anything new, strange, different? Well, one of the things that we have lined up on Friday night is, and and the one thing we we didn't mention so far is we've got Maureen Halloran that's going to be joining us, and she's never been to the Shanley, and those of us that know Maureen know of her talents. So when we get there Friday afternoon. She's allowed to go to like one or two rooms. That's her bedroom and the bathroom. Other than that, she's not going to be roaming around. She's not going to get a chance to get the feel of the Shanley. So what we're going to do before the actual uh, paranormal investigation is I'll be walking around with her throughout the Shanley. And Jess, Mark's wife, is going to be following with the cam. So the people out there that are, that are viewing this will be able to see firsthand her interpretation and what she's picking up in each room. So that's going to be a little bit unique and different, something that we haven't done there in the past. Well, then I think you need to, when, once she gets there, take her directly to the general store and leave her there. Because if yeah. you remember, Patty walked in the door, took a deep breath, and dropped her bags right there. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I you know, I can't keep her out of the whole place, but she's definitely not going to go to the bordello or the third floor. I mean, she can hang out in the great room, but all the other rooms are off limit. Her, her room's actually going to be up in the bordello. So I'm just going to tell her, you're going to have to use the facilities on the first floor, and that's it. You're not allowed anywhere else. So, I, you know, I, I'm actually looking forward to that because of what you've been telling me, Kim, on, on how she was at the hospital. I mean, it, she just was fabulous on, on picking up things. Maureen does not want to know anything about the Shanley as far as the spirits, the history, any of the things that we've done there, she has not been told a thing. So she's basically gone in as if I put the, the blindfold on her. Well, and with her, it's amazing because when she's there in person, from what we saw, it is two totally different people. 
I mean, her face changes, her voice changes. She goes from a billion miles an hour in 2.6 seconds to really slowing down, taking her time. It, it's a, it was an amazing transformation. Mm -hmm. And what was, that. what was what was another event that, that was validation for her? As we were, we basically doused the hospital with her. We basically spent, I think, two and a half hours mm -hmm. and basically walked the entire, not into every room, not into every closet, but into every major area of the hospital. And I just wrote down what she what she was saying. Um, it validated a lot of stories that were there. There was also some stories that nobody or, I don't want to say stories, but reasons why that hospital shut down um, and kind of the direction that the whole location went back and right before it shut down and un and at that time they had not completely cleaned all of the paperwork um, out of the office area that was still there yeah that one file room and we actually went in there and found some monthly reports that had back months on them um, that showed the financial decline of this place. So that was like instant validation for what she was saying. And nobody else, and to my knowledge, nobody else since has mentioned that. <coughs> and I know for a fact she didn't go roaming around over there to even have a chance to find those beforehand. So, I mean, it's just one of those kind of things. Um, yeah, it, it, was just, it was just very strange because with Maureen, she I love her to death, but she has a little scatterbrain when she does a reading. It goes in nine million directions. That's why she tells people to go look at archives and, and, and listen to recordings of the right. readings so that they can go back and pick up on all the things because she'll, she'll just go. she just spit it out. But when she got to that hospital, it was very analytical. It was very outlined. It was one, uh, A, B, C, D, two. I mean, it was right. very and it was unusual to see that. Well, I, yeah, don't, well, I don't think she's so much scatterbrained. I just think she gets such an outpour of information that she she tries to talk faster than and she doesn't hold any she's trying to talk to keep up with her brain and her brain's actually going faster in her mouth yeah i i can i can see that and i was just going to say the same thing can you imagine if we were getting inundated with all these thoughts like your mouth can't move fast enough to get it out It'd be really cool if you're able to hook something to your head and it just projects on the screen <laughs> yeah we need one get on yeah. it mark yeah, really. Sorry, Jazz. Uh, another thing different that we're going to be doing, uh, thanks to Mark, because Mark's a tech guy, um, I just say to him, <coughs> Mark, this is what would really be cool if we could do this. And I sit back, and about two days later, he comes to me and says, you know that we, we're going to be able to do this now. Is You know how uh, whenever I, I do an event with an investigation, I always have Marla Brooks open up, op do that opening of protection? Mm hmm um, normally, the people that are just there hear it, but now Mark has got it to the point when she does it, it will be live streaming for us. So everybody will out that are that are out there watching us will be able to see what we're privy to. Yeah, it's just one of those things, and you know, as a you know, Eric, I mean, you can relate is just working with the broadcast software, trying to upgrade and improve and. Yeah, so we're not, yeah, the, the Fort Mifflin, we could hear her, but nobody could see her. But now you actually will be able to see her and and uh, and and see us at the same time. So what's going on? So it'll be uh, it, it's just a nice another thing that so that the folks who are watching, you know, on the web and in the chat room can feel a little more in, involved with it because they'll get to be able to see really what's going on in that two-way interaction. So that's yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, that's you know. Again, all those little things that, we, that Mary and I picked up on that you know we took note of and said, okay, we got to fix this, gotta fix that, got to make this better, and you know it's it's just a work in progress. You know, the idea is really just to try to bring the, the investigation as much forward as we can, allow folks to get involved and be interactive with it, and to ask questions and to really see better what the investigators are seeing and what they're hearing and all those things that you know that. You know, the DVR, the fact that we can tie into your DVR is awesome, and that's a, a big integral part of what the show is. And now the fact that we're going to have a camera that's following and doing close-ups, and we're going to have, 
you know, the paranormal puffing on the broadcast, you know, the, the God helmet's going to make an appearance and going to be used on air, you know, probably from the Bordello and things like that. Like, you know, we're going to be de debuting and revisiting some of these classic ITC devices and techniques, you know, between the your traditional sweeping radios and, you know, your, your again, paranormal puck and the God helmet and, you know, those types of things that uh, we, we, we could kind of touch on in past investigations or at least broadcasts, but couldn't really demo them as, as, uh, as, as well as I hope we'll be able to demo them coming up next weekend. So. And, and, and maybe if you could, Mark, speak a moment about what the I know what it is. But speak a moment about what the God Helmet is. Well, the God Helmet, um, actually, Jess doesn't mind driving it because it's sitting over on our... We have, I'm actually running a, a paranormal workshop tomorrow for our group, and I'm hosting it here, so I've got all the equipment out on display, so it's like a paranormal gift shop. So actually, I can show you guys right now what it, what it looks like. Uh, here it is. So... <clears throat> The God Helmet, or also known as uh, the, the Temporal Controller, more like, um, is a device that it's, it works in several different ways. The, a standalone, like it is right here, or it can actually can interface with the computer software, the USB, where you can actually program custom settings. It's then connected via this nice tether cable to actually has a few eighth inch jacks, one for audio, another one for def uh, sensory deprivation goggles, which were never brought to uh, full development because this is actually a prototype that was built. And then it connects to these four electromagnetic sensors that are in a grid, and it's with a headband where you actually wear this. The idea is you actually wear it either in front or behind one of your, one of your, your temples, and there's a uh, Three program modes where there's an environmental setting where basically what it does is it emits very targeted uh, ELF and EMF frequencies through these sensors and actually alters your brain waves. So the, the nickname God Helmet stems from that in a test group, some, in some users not only do they have the experience or the sensory experience of some type of entity or being in the room, some of them went so far as that they actually thought that God was actually in the room. Like, it was such a profound and deep ex uh, psychical experience that that's what they felt. So that's how the God Helmet came to be. And this is one of Bill Chappell's devices, the man behind digital dowsing. He's the one who, uh, just about every ITC-related or modern-day paranormal device, he's made it between this and the Ovalis, the Puck, the, you know, like, all these devices that, you know, six and seven years ago just didn't exist, groups didn't know they exist or how to use them, and now yeah, just about every major television show has had them, and, and more and more groups are using his devices. Um, so what I'll be doing with this at the, at the Shanley is I'll be running it in environmental mode, which is really, it's a, it's a 10 minute program that which pre-programs frequencies that the idea is it's supposed to bring your, your frequency and kind of get you in tune with the environment. So you become more open, more receptive to the potential of other things happening. I actually used this in the orphanage in Gettysburg on an experiment where I did three or four, I was actually three sessions with it in the orphanage basement and that was when I had that experience where this little boy spirit pretty much materialized and told me his story while I was back in that cubby hole, that, that sub-basement. And it freaked me out because I didn't understand what really was going on because it was such so clear. The clarity of what the experience was more than I, than I, I can really say that I have on an average basis. And the details that I was getting from this kid about his experience and what had happened, it just it left, me, it left me floored. And I can't help but think that this had something to do with it, you know. And I know it wasn't that all completely up here because there were two other investigators pre present when it happened, and one of the investigators was sitting just outside the room when the boy went to leave and, and kind of le like left my area. The investigator saw this, this shadow figure was about the size of a child like go past her. So there was some instant validation that it wasn't just something that my mind was creating because I just nuked myself with a you know, with a, <laughs> with a brain altering device. So it's interesting. It's, 
I had to sign about 12 pages worth of release and waivers uh, before Bill would even ship it to me um, because he just doesn't want any liability. I mean, he, he, you know, all of his devices clearly say, you know, use at your own risk, and it says experimental control device. Um, but one of the more interesting things about this is how it interfaces with the computer where you can program very specific brain frequencies and brain waves and, and have them cycle at whatever uh, duration and frequency that you want and create you know altered states without chemicals, without anything but this particular device. So we're actually going to use this live on the air at the Shanley. Um, I've used, actually used this at the Shanley before in the Bordello, but not with, with cameras present. So I'll probably be the one that will probably be the guinea pig and wear this. Um, folks get kind of scared off by this device. I know that back in the day during CCPRS, when this device first appeared, nobody would touch it, nobody would wear it, nobody would try it. And I was the only one going, oh, what? It's, it's fine. Look at me. You know? so. Now you know why we never touched it. Right? <laughs> But, uh, Mark, Mark's always tried different things. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say sign Sal up, and he just typed in the room, sign him up. Well, Sal <laughs> used it. Sal and Jenny used it. Um, they used it at, um, was it Fort Mifflin? Yeah. So uh, one the Fort Mifflin investigation, the one that Mary, you got really sick. And yes. Had to miss. Everyone actually on the investigation used it, which was a first, because usually I'm the one sitting in the corner going, you know, Oh, it's 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 fun. Hardly noticeable. What? So, yeah, but uh, usually you have the tinfoil hat over the top of it. That's true. Oh, uh, we have another one. Anita just messaged me privately that she'll try it. <laughs> no, I mean I'm gonna open. I'm, I'm gonna open. It's, I mean I'm not gonna prohibit anyone from using it, but I'm not gonna force it either. So it's one of these things that, you know, I'm thinking the Bordello. Possibly the gentleman's quarters, you know, like I want to pick a quiet location that we can send someone off into by themselves mm -hmm. and wear this and have the experience on camera and see what happens. Um, I will say that, that there, I was with an investigator out of all the few years I've had this and used it who did have a negative experience, but I think that is um, a rarity, not the norm. Um, but yeah, this is just one of the devices that will be officially making its debut on the show next weekend. Along with, uh, you know, several other devices that were sitting around the table. Um, but yeah, that's the temporal controller, or also known as the God Helmet. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, well, I know the last, one of the last trips, not, not before the Paracon that I was up there, we actually did the um, Gonsfeld up there, and Sal volunteered for that too. Of course, that's also when we, I discovered that Sal has a, a snore a small one um, but what what we found out is because of the brainwave patterns that we use we use white noise with brainwave patterns introduced into it so we'll actually cycle you down um, he told me the next morning that it after that gone so that was the best sleep he'd had in six months it's hmm. almost like a reset <laughs> okay well I can see I mean it's you know that's the thing is this device this particular device it's there's not a lot of data on it to, to know the effects. I mean, you know, if you if you if you follow or do your research about frequent, you know, you know think, one of the theories is that everything is frequency and vibration, right? I mean, so the idea that we're using the like, you know, the, the, the coming back to basic EVP theory is that, you know, it's you know, is it imprinting on the tape? Is it electromagnetic conversion? You know, so it's frequency vibration. All these things happening. We all know that the Earth has these naturally emitting frequencies and it's been shown in certain studies that certain frequencies can have certain effects on the human body that's so that the age-old debate about you know the family a generation of families that have all gotten cancer because they live near the power station they lived under the high power lines because of those extremely powerful ELS and EMF frequencies that they're getting bombarded with you know those types of things so I'm, I'm really looking to put some real, eventually I'm going to, be, going to put some more controls and parameters around that particular device so I can gather data. I'm actually, a couple of years ago, another investigator and I were actually looking at getting an, uh, an EEG machine so we can actually really measure the brain waves coming off uh, uh, while you're using a device like this. And even I wanted to, to, to do some measurements on psychics that, that are, when they were having 
there's visions and the experience and getting the sensors and actually seeing what what is the brain seeing how is the brain reacting but that's not for next weekend that's something that will probably be next year <laughs> okay i have a question for you sure. we're, we're, we're constantly discussing emfs we know what emfs are what they stand for what's ELF? uh extremely low frequency you know it's the same family same same general principle behind the ELF as it is EMF. It's just, um, it's, it's, you know, these, those really, the, the, the frequencies that are not audible to the human ear, but can be felt, Let's you know, depending on, the, uh, depending on the decibel level. It, you know, that one of the more famous um, or controversial things relating to ELFs was uh, back in the 70s, the the the, we, the U.S. government or the U.S. in surveillance or intelligence agency basically discovered that there was this frequency that was that was being we were being bombarded with uh, through certain radios and frequencies called which they became known as the woodpecker uh, frequency and it was actually originating from Russia. So there's been talk about and theories about that like how these types of frequencies and things have been used to do certain things to cause people to have certain reactions. Um, you know, Tesla himself is well known to have created devices and, you know, his famous death ray that was fixed atop of his offices in New York City that has been theorized was the, what caused that Tunguska blast in Siberia, Russia, that, that basically caused the no summer to happen for that year because of this huge blast that they think was a meteor but there was no evidence of it because you know all these things so there's a lot of power behind this stuff and that's what you have to be careful about but uh, I think that there is something to it as it relates to the paranormal field that you know I, I like it's been interesting looking over the last so many years how EMF meters themselves have evolved you know I mean I've got a table over there with six or seven different meters and it's from one, ones that are just two or three LED lights that says good, warning, bad, to full analog meters, to the fully digital meters that have, you know, all these other features on them that, you know, this. so it's, 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 it's clearly that these devices are evolving and we're starting to get a little more focused in on, you know, where these things are coming from, you know, what is the relation to EMF, to the spirit phenomena, because... We've all used EMF meters, right? I'm sure at one point you've all had that black Lutron meter that's the black digital meter. And how many times have you been on an investigation where you've had your EMF meter and you're looking at it and it's absolutely zero, but something's happening? Yeah, right? a lot. Where it's maybe an individual, it may be the group having some type of group experience, whether it's an auditory uh, voice phenomenon, whether it's they feel something, they see something, but yet the EMF meter doesn't do anything. So... My point of that is that, is that it's going to continue to evolve. These devices are going to continue to evolve. The fact that they've got, you know, even these devices now where that you can basically hook a microphone into it and it converts audible frequencies into EMF fields. So it's another way of potentially communicating and trying to get some kind of recording back or communicating because, again, if, if the theory is that EMF fields are, are, you know, are being generated or caused by spiritual phenomena, and that's partly how EVPs are happening. So if you could communicate directly in the EMF field, why not? But, you know, some of these theories are really good. Some of them are, I think, going to be works in progress for, for quite some time. I mean, as you know, there are no, it's not exact science. We don't have the all the answers, and, and I think that's what's, good for the field is uh, are the folks that are like the guys like the Bill Chapel and guys like David Roundtree who are pushing the envelopes of science and technology and coming up with new theories and new methods and new techniques and new tools that folks like us, who we may not be the pioneers who invented them, but eventually we can, they, they become accessible to us that we can use them or start adapting those methodology. I mean, look at Sal. I mean, he's invested in the Geiger counter and these other devices, and he's starting to do more data logging and getting put more parameters around how he's gathering and investigating. And I think a lot, of, and I know the weekend that we all shared at the Shanley for the conference, you know, David Roundtree had a big influence on that. I mean, 
mean, the way that he set up that, that, that device on the third floor and took over the whole end of the building and was showing that he was getting some real-time results was, you know, very impressive. And I know, Eric, that you participated in that more than I did. So I know you got to see firsthand some of the results and things that were happening with, with, those, with that type of equipment. Sure. I got radiated more than a baked potato at a nursing home, I think. I, I mean, it was, it, it was, I mean, it was interesting. The whole, the whole thing with the radiation is a scary, is a scary part of what we do. Because long-term exposure to low-level radiation is dangerous. Right. You know, it's not, it's not you might have taken an attachment home. It's not that you might um, fall down and, and sprain an ankle. I mean, we're talking... We're talking cancer. We're talking lymphomas. We're talking some serious stuff with the exposure to it. Right. So I mean. Right, and and I think that's been for years overlooked. <clears throat> you know, I bought. I mean, my, my first. I mean, I I still have my Geiger counter sitting there over the table. It's an old analog civil defense Geiger counter from the fifties. I bought it because that idea, and I remember. You know, this is not. This is only like you know six and seven years ago, being scoffed at and kind of almost made fun of or being poked at because like, well, what do you need with a Geiger counter? You don't. You need a Geiger counter to do paranormal investigating. Like, well, why wouldn't you? You know, it's another measurable change in the environment that mm-hmm. is that intangible that we you know you know. But, and and I'm glad to see that that's you know like somebody like again like David Rowntree is really embracing the idea of radi- of background radiation and how it affects the environment, how it affects the individual, how it affects the it, it's effect in the, in the in the realm of paranormal experience. So it's, it's good, mean, to, good to it, see that stuff nice coming around. It's nice to see people not stumbling around in the dark anymore, and they're starting to try to answer the hard questions: the how, the why, when. Well, that there there are becoming less ghost hunters out there and yeah. more. Investigators and researchers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I, I certainly hope so. That that it 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 really kind of confounds me a bit when I when I hear these stories over and over again about these groups that have gone in and done these cases and they just turn things upside down, inside out because they have no clue what they're doing or how they're doing it because all they know is what they see on TV. And then oh. you got the real investigators, the real groups that have to go in and try to do damage control and clean up. And uh, it, it, it's funny, you know. Being at 80, 90 percent of the, the folks I'm associated with on Facebook are probably paranormal. That is probably the most common rant that I see, and, they, and I'm sure you guys see it too. Where it's some investigator or some team who had to go in and clean up somebody else's mess because they just completely screwed it all up. So I really hope what you what you said is true. That we're, that that trend that we're starting to trend now towards away from the novelist, you know, the, the ghost hunter, to folks who are really trying to become more investigative, more research oriented. I mean, that's really one of the main things as far behind what's driving the, the organization that Mary and I are starting up, the co-op, is that it's more than it's it's not just focusing on the paranormal folks. It's it's focusing on the other elements. The idea is to bring together like-minded folks to establish some peer review capabilities and resources to, to actually start vetting people against each other in a way that look. It's about raising your skill sets. It's about raising the field as a whole. So here's my, the whole idea is here's an organization that's hopefully going to foster that, help bring that together. You know, it's not. I know it's not a completely original idea, and I know that folks and the other pioneers have tried it in, in the past. And the hardest thing that I've learned about anything in the paranormal is keeping a group together, is keeping that momentum going. So it's a it's a big undertaking and something that I, I don't. I know it's not going to happen overnight. I know it's going to be probably a few years down the road before really, you know, as far as this group really get going. But that's the idea: is you know, let's let's put the egos aside. Let's, let's get rid of the 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 the, the, the para celebrity notions. Let's actually get to the work. Let's help each other out. Let's share. Let's 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 brainstorm. Let's review each other's work so that we can keep it honest and and keep it moving forward. So the guys like David Roundtree can can really get you know not just the recognition, but be able to share his work and his work become that much more accessible, so that folks like Sal and I who want to do his research or you know completely recreate some of his tools and techniques 
when they have more direct access to that, because we'll have a support of, of groups and resources. Say, okay, oh, you need this device? I've got it. Okay, you got that? All right, well, let's, let's put together this, this research project and let's make it happen. Oh, here's an online database where everyone can upload their data. We can look at it. We can edit it. We can, you know, those are all the things for me that's driving why I wanted to get away from just starting another paranormal group and starting something that can potentially be much bigger than that. Well, you know, this was something that Kim and I were chatting about the other night uh, in the chat room. Uh, somebody had brought up an interesting point, and and we kind of continued our own little sidebar to the fact that somebody said to me not too long ago that paranormal investigating is kind of getting pushed off to the wayside. It's not as popular as it was before. And, yeah, they're right in, in one aspect because – when I went searching for you, Mark, which I didn't know who you were, I typed in paranormal investigative groups, and I got one hit in the area. And that was, believe it or not, seven years ago. Now you do the same, you know, like three or four years ago, you type in and you were getting hundreds of them, okay? But all these, the diehards are still out there. And just like you and I, we did a splitting. I went and did my thing. You were still continuing with the group. But we ended up back together. And I have to believe that if I didn't find your group and get into CCPRS and, and be taught, you, got, you guys really taught me well. You know, you were serious from day one. I mean, we had our good times. But, you know, you never sugarcoated anything. And, you know, we had our meetings and, and we did the evidence review and we did the follow-ups and we did all that stuff. You know, a lot of these, I'll call them Johnny-come-lately groups, they, they watch the shows, and they're like, oh, this is great. But what they don't understand, getting getting to that point to be able to do an investigation. I was case manager there for a while. I was also your events person. I know what it was like to get to that point, to get to group there. You also handled all, you know, most of the equipment. We get there, the setup. How many hours did it take to set up the equipment? And then how many hours did it take to, to take down? We were spending more time setting up this stuff than the actual investigation because to do it you do it right and even afterwards you know the review it just didn't stop people see on television in a half hour the equipment they pull up in front of the place the equipment's there they're you know next thing you know it's set up they're back and in and all within a half hour the investigation's completed including the evidence review mm -hmm. now you know it takes weeks to review evidence for maybe four or five hours going to somebody's home or going to a location. So right. I think when a lot of these people found out that you need a little bit more than your camera and, you know, and 10 minutes of your time, those, those people left. And people like ourselves, Kim and Eric, and quite a few out there were still standing. And, you know, we like to be around people that are like us. I mean, you know, we meet the Sal and Jens along the way, and, and they want to improve things. And one thing I, I want to bring up about Sal and Jen is a few years back, you know, they they, they really got the bug on the flashlight thing. They they, they made, I don't know if you got to see that, what he made, Mark, at one yep. of the investigations. But he took the time to make this piece of equipment with flashlights. And, and for like a year, he was so happy. They both were so happy with the results with this flashlight uh, testing that they were doing. And one day, they showed up without their flashlights. And I said, what's the matter? And they were reviewing and reviewing, and something wasn't quite adding up to them. And they realized that maybe there was a little bit of an issue that the results they were getting may not have been ac accurate. They dropped it completely. They removed all of that evidence that they got from the flashlights because they couldn't 100% say that it was, you know, it was true. And, and that's what you have to admire with people like Sal and Jen and others that are out there that are like them that they're willing to say, I don't think this is exactly what we're getting. Some people will continue to say, oh, yeah, I did really great with an EVP session. The flashlights went on when I, you know, when I asked them to command and this and that. But they actually pulled it out of their investigation because they thought they were wrong. And that, and that's what, you, you know, you've got those kind of people out there with integrity. And, right. and I was just fixing to say that, Mary, that's the exact word I was going to use, <coughs> is Sal and Jen have integrity. And their name means something to them, so they're not going to put something out there that they don't totally believe in. And I think it's important to point out, too, there's nothing wrong 
there's absolutely nothing wrong with somebody being a, a ghost hunter slash thrill seeker slash just interested. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. It's when somebody that's at that level tries to think that they can go in and, and send a spirit to the other side or they can, you know, they have these really wild claims or they think that spreading glitter, glitter, glitter everywhere will confuse the ghosts and they'll go away. And yes, Mark, that really happened and it happened in Oklahoma. Yes. Um, but, I mean, it's, 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 it's nothing wrong with that. Just don't try to be hmm. exactly. Don't try to be something that you're not. Don't make me hit it. Well, that, that what you what you said right there is is one of the fundamental flaws in our field because you can come out of nowhere and overnight you can reinvent yourself and say, "Well, I'm a paranormal investigator. I'm and a I, can, I got all the gadgets and I can do all that stuff, but, but yet have no experience." No real understanding and knowledge about what is, why are you, what is the EMF meter? Why are you even using it? It's not a ghost meter, you know. You know that's what the most amazing thing is that, it, and, and the other end is that the smart inventors who are generally trying to make real equipment, they, they're, they're not stupid, so they know how to make money by, okay, it's a sweep radio that now says ITC device or ghost box, you know, these things where, you know, again, five, six years ago, the only way you got a sweep radio is you had to, clip pins off of a motherboard or a soldering board and, and hope that you didn't just break, you know, $40 radio because you cut something too short or you, you know, trial and error, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it, that, that's why I'm hoping that at some point, whether it happens in our lifetime or not, the field has to get to a level where they're really, you, yes, you can come into it and say, all right, I want to be a paranormal researcher, but... I don't have the experience, so I need to work my way up to this. And I know that there's certain a level of skills that I need to have. I need that you know some kind of quantifiable, viable, measurable skill set, not just going to the International Ghost Hunter Society and getting a certificate that you paid forty-five dollars says that says you're a certified ghost hunter, or going to one of those shoddy like college, online colleges in the UK. That for six hundred dollars you can get a parapsychology degree that doesn't really mean anything, but you know what I mean an actual governing body that has real curriculum where you're learning the real science behind the technology, you're learning the equipment, you're actually learning real scientific methods and tools and tools and you know the the things you really have to do to be a real researcher. You know, and these are things that I've been chasing after for years. I I don't have education. You know, a, a college education as far as science and research and all that. So, you know, I, I'm doing the best that I can. But you know, it's, for me to to say I am a true researcher, you know, is I'm admitting it's a little bit of a stretch because I don't have that 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 body of knowledge behind me. I have the, the experience, the trial and error, and the well, that didn't work, or that equipment was a waste of money, or uh, that wasn't actually a ghost at all. That was somebody's stomach. You know, those kinds of things you just you you learn from from your mistakes, but. But at that at that point, doesn't that make you a researcher? A researcher is researching. It's not. I'm a paranormal expert. Yeah. Yes. You're 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 getting it in a more uh, you know old school or just learning the trade as you go, almost like a self-taught apprenticeship. But I think there's still something to be said to having some formalized governing body that says, "All right, look, if you're going to be a, a paranormal photographer, can you?" <coughs> Do you can photograph in a way. Do you know the camera? Do you know what your f stops do? Do you know all the? You know what I mean? Like you can't just pick up a camera and start taking pictures. And and I, I just have a hard time with you know again you know orbs. Why are orbs still being considered paranormal photography? Because well, there are it's groups not. who actually believe it. Yeah, there's entire what? there are entire not even necessarily ghost hunting groups. On Facebook, there are entire pages of groups that are nothing but orb photos. And I, I have to say, I respect those people because they were able to find those cameras that have that function that puts that little red line around the important stuff. And the arrow. And the arrow. I have yet to be able to find a camera that does that. Well, I mean, I have a, I mean one of my books in my library, it's called The Orb Project, where it's all about... Again, the old photography, and the, I don't know, you know, it's, 
I try to not be judgmental, and when I've interacted with people who show me orb photographs that they absolutely believe is something, you know, it's like you don't want to just take the photo and crap all over it and be like, well, that's garbage, even though in my head I'm going, you're that's an garbage. idiot, but, you know, it's like, you, you, you know, you got to have, have some tact and truth, but sure. at some point, you know, it's like, all right, folks. There has not been an orb photograph yet that has been any, in my opinion, any proof of anything other than you just your your flash was too close to the lens and you caught some type of anomaly. Until Glenda the Good Witch shows up in the actual bubble. Right. Well, and, and here's here's the deal too. Um, you know, when you're a kid, you reach out and you touch the stove and it's hot and you pull your hand away. Okay. These are grown folks. If they want to flop their hand on top of the stove and let it smolder. That's their right? that's their business. Because just like everything else with this field, you're not going to change the mind of a true cynic, and you're not going to change the mind of a true believer. And if these people want to believe that it's Aunt, you know, Aunt Glenda from three generations back that's just coming to check on me while my house is dirty, then God bless you. Here's your sign. Move along. You know. I, I just I, I ignore that that whole entire set of information. I found that's the easiest way to do it because when you try to give them technical suggestions of why or what that could be, no, it's Aunt Glenda and it's Aunt Glenda, damn it! And if you don't believe it, get off my page. And that's exactly the attitude they take. Well, that, yeah. the, these are the same people who argued with us over c cigarette smoke, oh my God. cold air, and snow. Yeah, it, it was angels, and because the, the the refraction of the snow came out with different colors, it was different types of angels, different levels of angels. It was. But see, that's what I do for fun. I go <coughs> post snow pictures on or pages. It's great fun. Yeah. It's great fun. That's what I do for kicks, you know. And I did actually do that. And and I, I actually got into an argument with people who were telling me what was in the picture, and I'm like, I was there. I know why this did this. This is not a herd because it was like a thousand snowflakes. That that was a couple years ago when St. Louis got hit right before the blizzard, and yeah. we already had 13 inches of snow. It was that snowfall. Yeah, but, so, yeah. but 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 still, the problem I have with that is, as you guys know, if you're in the field long enough, and you and you keep investigating, you keep doing it. You may not have had those experiences when you started out, but after some time, you're going to have have had gained some real experience. You're going to you would have had you know some possibly even that profound almost life changing like wow I just just saw a ghost and it said hi to me you know like and what's scary, what 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 just, just bothers me is that these, these same type of folks who in this for years are still doing this with orb photography are still doing this with like it's like there are so many other things you can believe in, you know, if, if so, like, what do you, like, what, like, how is it that the, the default is that this, this little white glowy speck in a, in a photograph is a, is a spirit when in reality it's not? And it tells me, it's like, like, what else are they missing? If, if that's what their evidence is or that's what their focus is, it's like. Well, I got to I got to say something to that one. Somebody sent me a picture. She was so obsessed with looking at this round thing above a doorway that she was missing to the right what appears to be a man standing there. And Kim, you know who I'm talking about. Yes, I sent you the picture. Yes, I do. And this, Kim, is not, not a guy standing there to the right? Yep. Right? Never saw it because all she was was focused on this orby looking thing. When I finally enlarged the picture, you know, and I'm looking at it, and I just kind of move it over a little bit. I'm like, whoa. I, and I sent it back. I said, hey, did you see this thing over here? Missed it all together. If it was a rattlesnake, it would have been her. Well, it, but not not to her benefit, but we, we had the same thing at OSPH. Tim Rankin had taken the one picture, and everybody was focused on the shadow by the elevator mm -hmm. and Angie walks up and goes who's the kid in Kim's lap nobody saw that because they were so and so many of them were trying to figure out what this other shadow was 
And then once we saw that, it, it, it was pretty much game on. Yeah. But I mean, you, you bring up a valid point, Mark, and and I, I think we do need some some kind of governing body. I, I don't know how effective they could be, because people that don't want to be part of it, you know, people that don't want to be part of it, it's like, I don't care what, whether they think I like what I'm doing or not. And then you've got the whole group. Well, who made you boss? Yeah. Exactly, and that's that. That's the right there are going to be the biggest two biggest hurdles mm -hmm. for anything like that to take up. But I still I still stick to that. It's it's got to happen. So I, for me, like my I'm going to try my 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 best to try to contribute to that. I may not be the one ultimately responsible for for that happening. I'm definitely going to try my part to give you my part to see to try to, to start doing that in some way to bring people like I mean think about it think if you had a, a, a think of it like a panel you had a panel of guys or investigators that had the education the knowledge the skills the guys like the David Roundtrees the guys like the Bill Chapels you know then there's folks like Rosemary Ellen Guiley you got you know these these folks that have the credentials that have the the knowledge and the education and the experience that can say look we agree together that you know a good ghost investigator, criminal investigator, should have had these core values, and these core values are defined as one, a good understanding of th this body of knowledge, whether it's science in the way that environmental. I mean, you know, I feel like sometimes we're all weathermen. If you're a good researcher, you, you have to be part weatherman because basically all the devices you're using are weather are, are weather devices that are measuring changes in the environment. So. If you don't understand the fundamentals of what a barometer does or what a thermometer does or an EMF meter, then you might as well just not use it. And again, I'm at the point where then you might as well just not use it at all because if you're going to use it and completely misinterpret what's happening with it, then that can almost do more harm than good because now you've got all this bad data out there that mm -hmm. is really kind of useless. You know, so. Well, it, that even goes back to the old school stuff. I mean sitting there using a candle you still have to know the weather right right or you know using streamers tied from a ceiling well you gotta understand how airflow works and right and things or like wind that chimes or, or any anything else right so you can see my point and this is like and my idea is not just apply that lens that idea to the paranormal but to psychics to reiki to to you know these other these other dis disciplines that <clears throat> that if you had a, if you think about how awesome you had a panel of ten of the most incredibly well known psychics that were genuinely gifted people that were working together to say hey here's a school of psychic research where you want to learn how to develop these skills you want to kind of test yourself to see what what do you have and what what could be what what area of psychic research would be better for me am I empathic. Am I clear audience? Am I clear? You know, like all these types of things. Or to have that ability to be able to identify that, I think you know that that's that's the end goal. Yes, you're going to have the naysayers. You're going to have the people who are going to be jealous or going to be envious who just simply don't want to get on board. But you know what? Those are the kind of people that eventually weed themselves out of the field anyway because they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. In my opinion. Well, and it's slowly but surely becoming apparent to everybody that. Just because you buy a millimeter, a voice recorder, and a flashlight, you don't get a coupon for a black suburban. And and your own show. And your own show for half a season. Well, and I think another thing that is starting to happen is a lot of the quote unquote ghost hunters are realizing all these cool locations on TV we can't necessarily get into. Yeah. And a, a few of them, one, are too far away. Some of them are way too expensive for any of us to afford unless we have the TV show. And some of them have just been investigated so much. I mean, like Waverly and... Well, they're turning Waverly into a bed and breakfast. Yeah. This was the last year. Of this, I, heard that, I heard that rumor the other day that the, the, this will be whatever they have booked is all that they're going to do. After that, the owners of the building are setting it down and remodeling it into a bed and breakfast. For 900 rooms? 
For, but, what, for the most recoverable parts of it. Right. Yeah. But I'm saying places like that, to me, have been so overly investigated. If, if there are, which I think there are, but for the most part, the spirits are sitting back going, yeah, I'm not talking to these idiots anymore. Yeah. I can only tell you my name so many times. You figure it out on your own. I'm done with you people. Knock on your own damn wall. Right. Good so, one. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's, we're at a crossroads, I think, and I think you'd agree with that, Mark, as far as the quote-unquote field would be concerned. We're at a crossroads. The shows have, the shows have been done and been done to death and done wrong and done right and, I mean, they're entertainment, but you can't take them for anything more than that nowadays. But we're at a crossroads in the actual field because there are a lot of people out there doing good work, but there's also a lot of people out there doing really stupid stuff. Not everything that you're talking to is a demon. I'm sorry. If I offend some Judeo-Christians, I'm sorry. But not every spirit is a demon. It's just not how it works. If you can pray to the Holy Ghost? Yeah. When you, when you narrow... We, we, can, we can hunt for him. But I mean, it's... it's like I said, oh. we're at a crossroads. We're, we have one group that's trying to move forward, like I said, and answer... The five hard questions. You got the other group over there that's drinking beer and having a good time and kind of just wants to be thrill seekers, and that's fine too. But don't claim to be something you're not. Don't claim to be a team that is a scientific investigation, and all you show up with is stuff that's got batteries in it. And other than that, you're, you're not even anywhere near scientific. And if all you have is a millimeter, you're not really being scientific either because a millimeter can't be calibrated. Can't be calibrated, and, and there's, there's no data logging. So, you're not really using it. You're using a weather rock. You might as well take a rock with you. Seriously. I and mean, if it gets wet, it's raining. Yeah. If you get some ghost on it, it's haunted. If there's no ghost on it, it's not haunted. It's a ghost rock. I can make a million dollars. But, but, but. Well, yeah, right, that, right and that coming back to two is, is, is uh, you know, why the ITC lounge is kind of evolving and turning into something, you know, the next level is. Not only do I, it's it's kind of like I've had enough of those shows. A well, lot, I've, I've had enough of those shows seven years ago, but uh, it's going to be it's it, it's a show that's on our terms. You know, it's done our way, the way we want it. You know, featuring the equipment and the tools and the methodology and the people that we want to focus on. And my the larger vision for that is eventually is I want to be able to go and 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 go on and, and focus on. Those teams that you're talking about, Eric, that the ones that are trying to ask the, answer the hard questions, the ones that are doing the real research, and put a spotlight on them and show, hey, say, hey, here's a team from Nashville, Tennessee, that has been around for six years. They're not in the, they're not on television. They're not, you know, they don't have their own line product line, but they're doing hard work. Well, here, you know, the ICC Lounge will focus on what they're doing, let people see what they're doing. And, and interact with it and share with it and it's you know in in, in a way that people and be, people who watch ICC Lounge over the last five years as it's been realize that sometimes all you are is looking at is a screen of the camera and that's it and, and that's that, sometimes not every little white blip is a, is an orb because yeah. we sit there in the chat room going bug well and bug and, dust. Right. and, and the, right. the, the thing the thing other thing too Mark like here at PEN I put this out there I haven't had any response yet. I'm willing to have people send me their video files. That's the hardest thing for anybody to review. Audio is what audio is. There is no two ways about that. If you record on a digital recorder, you got some time you got to invest. But when it comes to the visual stuff, I'm willing to charge people $5 an hour. We'll show their stuff on the network. We'll pack the chat room and let people review it. So that doesn't mean they get out of reviewing it, but it will speed stuff up if they have a list of times that other people are doing it. And Saying, you, hey, there's a shadow at 6.25. Right. And, and I right. would have thought that people would be all over that. But once again, I didn't count on how narcissistic our field is. And, oh, you're not going to get to look at my video. Well, that's... that's... You know, and we're, we're trying to offer it as a service to help out. And, and people, once again, people kind of rejected the idea because nobody wants to share their video evidence. They would rather have it go unreviewed, you know, and, and we could show it on the network. They got four channels. We could show all four, you know, as long as it's got a timestamp, 
visible somewhere on the screen, people could watch. And we could help groups get our evidence reviewed to get to a client that may or may not need to see it or whatever. Right. But nobody, once again, no matter how much I put it out there, nobody wants to. Have you. You're not going to get to see my video. You're crazy. Big furry dog, get away. Well, again, because it, it, people are still, groups are still very territorial. Oh, my God. About what they do, where they do it, and how they do it. And that that's... That, that that and that the biggest thing is that they fail to realize is that's what's killing the field. Yeah. That's what's that's what's keeping us broken and disjointed and not able to. You know, it, it's it, you know, it's 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 good. It's it, that's the problem is that they can't you can't get over the idea of being the team. That, like it has to be our team and our the way we do it. No, it's it's okay. Share your methodology. Share your tools. Share your techniques. Share your evidence because someone else from a, di from a different perspective may see something or catch something that you didn't see. Share like your percent. locations. Or or maybe if you're open to some honest, genuine criticism and feedback, you may actually learn something. You may actually say, you know, this technique we've been using for the last three years with these flashlights, okay, yeah, we've been getting responses, but reality, it's not. I mean, but I guarantee it, that there are some groups out there that the flashlight is like the go-to, one of their go-to ITC devices. Mm -hmm. And they've been using it long enough, I'm sure, to realize to make the same conclusions that Sal made. You know, it's like, there's, not, there's something to it. Hey, come on, I'm, I'm, I'm the six years into using these sweep radios, and where I, my mindset was in year one to where I am now has completely changed. I, I really think that now I need to be shown, we really... That 80-90% of the stuff that hits on these radios is not anything but chatter and and, and just sh sheer coincidence that it's really that 5-10% to 10 of, of, of hits that may actually be something. Right. And I can cite previous cases that I where I felt completely opposite, but now I can go, you know what, I'm be, if I'm being honest, if I'm being truthful to myself and truthful to what I'm hearing, there's nothing really there. It's not really there, you know, but... Again, folks get so attached to a methodology or a tool or a device that they lose that objectivity, they lose that ability to to say, you know what? All right, I have been I've logged 400 hours of of, of on these devices. Am I, am I really getting the results that I think I'm getting? Am I really, you know, what what you know? If I maybe if I share these my top 20 EVPs with several other groups or other investigators from other groups. Will they still? Will they hear what I'm hearing? Will they think that or interpret what I am interpreting as? But folks aren't doing that. They simply just aren't doing that. And and, and I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing folks doing it. And I, and you know. And I like I said. I, to me, I get my, where I really kind of pay attention is really in the social media. Is is how the investigators and the other groups and how they're interacting and how they're you know. There's just it's 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 we're not there yet we're really not there yet and i like i said i hope that that we really are at those crossroads because things have do really have to change i think for this because we're kind of plateauing and we've been plateauing for a while now and despite all the new te technology the core fundamentals are still we're still still broken well and they're still doing it with locations P public locations that they can't really take over, but if they have a good private location, they won't tell you where it's at. Me, I would be, hey, come in, do your investigation, and see if you're getting what I'm getting. That way, I have validation. It's not, well, it's my building, and you're not allowed near it. Please, come in. Figure out what happened here. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why... I I made the best of the situation with the house in Westchester it was, well, here's an opportunity that I'm living in this very his historically old and haunted house. I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to broadcast it. I'm going to, when I can, I'm going to let people come in and check it out for themselves, you know, to see and experience it for themselves. And, you know, that's how you, I mean, I mean, that's how you got to do it. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you have to be able to let folks, especially if you think you're onto something, 
you know, if you can't, if you like keeping your cards that close to your chest, you know, you think you're going to win, but in reality, I just think you're you're just doing you're doing more harm to yourself than yeah. good because you you know it's you're really not getting anywhere. I mean, it's no, take a poll seriously. You, you, take a group of like on Sunday, go go down the line and see how many people say, oh, it was great investigation, had a great time at the investigation, and ask them. Go right down the line and ask them where was it at and see how many will actually tell you or tell you, I'm sorry, it's undisclosed, we can't, we can't give out that yeah. information. And if you're in a, It's if, ridiculous. And if you're an experienced enough group to go actually do a client-based investigation um, well, and, actually, and actually help a family understand what's going on um, and you don't want to talk about locations, that's okay. If, it, if it's private, that's fine, but I'm talking about like... I won't say the name of the team, but there's one team in St. Louis. Yeah. And, you know, fantastic investigation. Really, where were you? Uh, it's on the it, I it was, it's a funeral home. Which one? I'm sorry, it's undisclosed. We, we can't give out that information. Really? Well, I drive a Porsche. It's out in the parking lot. You want to go see it? I mean... It, it's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would much rather have someone come in and say, hey, you know, that, that stupid clicking you heard is the clock over here, the spring broke mm -hmm. or something. I mean, good or bad, debunking or, you know, cap capturing more evidence. Either way, it's helping the field. It's not all mine. The goals from what's in the movie with it Finding Nemo. Yeah, mine, 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 yeah. mine, mine. Some paranormal conferences do sound that way. Yeah, they do. No, not ours. Ours was awesome. Ours was the con of awesomeness. Okay, guys, we are getting towards kind of to the end of this. One more time, give everybody Mary, give everybody <laughs> where they can find uh, buy tickets. Well, if, if you're interested in going to the uh, Halloween Shanley event, that's October 25th and 26th. But unfortunately, the 26th is sold out. We still have some tickets for Friday night the 25th. You can go to www.shanleyhotel.com, click on the events tab, and scroll where it says the, uh, the Halloween event there with our name. And Mary can also be seen in East Texas on November 9th at the Marshall Haunted Holidays. That's right, it's official. I got my airline tickets today. That's right, <laughs> she is a speaker. And the next day you can catch her at Metaluna Boutique and Stones because she'll be there autographing her book. Yes. She will. And everybody, don't forget, once again, you can come see the Yeti the weekend before Marshall's Haunted Holidays if you're in San Antonio. Um, Go to the Riverwalk. At, at the Emily Morgan Hotel uh, for the Dia de los Muertos Paranormal Conference. How about that? You go, big boy. Um, and Scott Grunewald is going to be there. In fact, I, that's the one reason I'm going to be very That's honest. why he's going. That's the one reason I really want to go. Other than I was invited, I have known Scott Grunewald for... Four years? Four years. And he's and never, never met him. And never met him. And I want, I want to go meet him. And he told me he's bringing me a tutu that will fit me. So the pictures, <laughs> the pictures could get interesting. Yeah, he, not sure. only is he bringing him a tutu, but also said we need to do some filming. So yeah. be prepared for anything. I, that's it all I'm saying. So let's get out of here. If you're going investigating this weekend. Be um, safe. Be safe. Um, Stay warm. Because it, tonight it's, cool. it's supposed to be like 45 for the high here tonight. So. I'm genetically yeah. designed for this weather. Whatever. <laughs> Some of us aren't. You've only got the two tablespoons of blood. Shut up. Mark's bringing glitter. Nice. Um, with that, we're going to get out of here. Everybody be safe. Have a great night, and we will see you next weekend. But wait, 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 wait. Monday. Monday, Monday, I'm Monday. just saying. We will right. be discussing one of Mary's favorite subjects that she's been wanting to discuss for quite a while. Cheesecake? No. Oh, I discuss that all the time. The Bell Witch. <laughs> The Bell Witch. With Tim Yancey. Woo! Can't wait. Yep. And with that, see ya. We gone.